So let's just talk about the solution side for a minute, because yeah. I think that's where you were really going uh, mm-hmm. on this, Gary. And, and the, the solution side is we talked about the addiction toolkit, and that's available, and that's available for public health officials. But the more powerful, more readily available, easier to use strategy for controlling revenge cravings and eliminating the grievances in your life is called, it turns out, forgiveness. And let me tell you what neuroscientists have found recently about forgiveness. It's fascinating. So the first thing that happens when you forgive somebody is that it shuts down that very pain network, the anterior insula that I was talking about, which is the pain of your grievance area in the brain. It turns that off completely when you forgive, which is a really important self-healing response and strategy that happens at a neurobiological level. How so can I, uh, can yeah, I just ask you this then? Maybe you can give us a better picture uh, because I've heard this. He many- just described Jesus. That, uh, well, you know? okay. Forgive them, Father. <laughs> Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yeah. Which, of course, any, anybody else hanging there would have been like, yeah, I know what you're doing. I'm up here. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> the hell, get me down. <laughs> like, anyway, um, <laughs> but can you give a picture of what forgiveness looks like in the mind of the person who's forgiving because some people have a very hard time wrapping their understanding around what do you mean when you say forgive them you know the the family of a child that's just been taken for whatever reason for whatever scenario finding forgiveness in those individuals this is in the court they have this in the courtroom all the time This, this there's the the person who killed a family member, right. and they're up for parole, right. or they could be about to be released, right. and they bring in the family, right. and this is a scenario ripe for this conversation. Yeah, the family doesn't come in and say, we forgive you. The family comes in and says, this is why you should not be let out. Yeah, so, so, so what does forgiveness look like in mm. the mind of the forgiver? Yeah, thank you. It's an excellent question. So in our society, right, we think of forgiveness and the word give that's part of that, you know, that word as meaning somehow a gift to the person who wronged you. Right. Absolutely isn't true. And we now know that for a fact at the neurobiological level. So forgiveness at the neuroscience level, it only benefits the victim, not the perpetrator. And you don't even need to inform the perpetrator that you're forgiving them to get the benefits. The first benefit Mm. that I, I just mentioned was that it stops, you know, it deactivates the pain network. So you're no longer feeling pain, but in an authentic way versus when revenge seeking, you're getting a hit of dopamine that's short, short lasting. It feels good for a while. And then you're left feeling worse, but wanting more. With forgiveness, you're just turning the pain network off entirely. The pain is suddenly gone from your from your brain, at least for moments after you've forgiven. And if you continue to forgive, that pain stays away up until and through forever, uh, because it just depends on how often you're willing to keep forgiving until the pain never shows back up. Do you say it does not have an, an important effect on the perpetrator? It does not have, uh, forgiveness does not have an uh, important psychological benefit for the victim. And what I mean by that is that I, I don't want to overstate that, because I think you're, well, you're asking an important and question. I'm getting this mixed up here. So Yeah, I, th- let, me, let me try and set that straight. Because I think that's a great, a great question. What I'm talking about is the benefits to the person who was victimized. Sure, a perpetrator who hears that they've been forgiven, it might make them feel better for, for a while. They don't want to feel like a perpetrator forever. So you might be giving them a benefit, but you don't need to do that to get the benefits for yourself, yourself that you that, need to the heal. Point. There's the, there's the yeah, rub. The the you don't okay. even have yeah. to go to them and say, I forgive you. No, it's not sharing. You can actually perform the act internally and you get all the benefits of that yeah. act being performed the same as if you went to them and said, I forgive you, but you don't even have to give them the 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 satisfaction of knowing that they're forgiven. <laughs> you know? That's so right. you can just That's be right. like, but, you go ahead no, and suffer, you piece of crap, but I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but there are people who become remorseful right. yeah. Yeah. after having committed crimes. Right. Truly it would boost their remorsefulness right. knowing that they have been forgiven. Yes, but here's the rub. What? 
they're going to have to forgive themselves. Ooh. Wow, Chuck, that's exactly what I was going to say, Chuck. You're absolutely right. The forgiveness okay, what that do we they need, need for? is we'll self-forgiveness. Chuck. Okay, Chuck, <laughs> yeah. Chuck, what's your next case that you're going to take? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to, ch- I'll just get off of this, and Chuck, you can run it, because, I mean, you've got it. <laughs> please don't. No, please, please don't. <laughs> yeah, I'm shooting from the hip, so please. <laughs> right. So, Well, your, your hip shots are fantastic. So what you've got, so there's three things that happen. Let me go, let me go over those, and then we can talk about it. So the first thing, like I said, is forgiveness deactivates the pain network. The second thing it does is it shuts down the pleasure and reward circuitry of addiction. So no more are you being nagged by these intrusive revenge cravings that are uh, driving you nuts or driving you toward committing a dangerous act. And then the last thing that forgiveness does is it reactivates your prefrontal cortex. It activates your self-control circuitry. All of this happens, and it's been shown in studies, by simply imagining that you forgave somebody. You don't have to talk to the the wrongdoer, the perpetrator. You don't even have to actually forgive the person. You can just imagine or pretend what it would feel like to forgive them. And you will experience in that moment, all three of these things all of a sudden, which usually for most people, they describe that experience as a sense of relief and kind of joy because they, first of all, the pain's gone. That's very relieving. And then they don't have this craving driving them insane towards revenge seeking and revenge rumination. They're actually healed and it's a real healing. It's not just covering it up with some dopamine. So your views here by you and your colleagues at the School of Medicine, it comes across, at least on the surface, as a a very novel way to think about revenge, uh, connecting it with the understanding of addiction. Any new novel idea in science will always have some initial pushback. So did you get such pushback from either psychiatrists or psychologists that would really rather think of it as a singular affliction that needs 300 hours of couch work? Yes, absolutely. So uh, the initial response from some people, even my colleagues at Yale, and I don't, I don't speak for any of them or the School of Medicine. I have to make sure that I'm clear in saying that. You don't have to um, say we will. We'll say that. No, you no, can no. say that, but I can't say that. Um, and and I don't. And I don't want to put any no, words course, in their course. mouths. But 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 some of my colleagues in academics in other areas, there's been some amount of pushback, but it's 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 rapidly falling away. I'm glad to say, and that's because the evidence here, because this is really based on neuroscientists around the world now who are coming up with the same results in study after study are starting to see that at a minimum, there does look like, first of all, that people who have a grievance and are contemplating revenge, A, are experiencing for a fact pleasure that's been studied and shown to be so. Uh, B, that they are uh, experiencing some form of driven uh, appetitive or uh, appetitive, if you say it that way, craving, uh, so that they're being driven towards it. And if they are unable to resist that urge, despite knowing the negative consequences, and there are almost always only negative consequences with revenge, and they're unable to resist that, that is the definition of addiction. But I will say most academics right now are very uncomfortable using the word addiction the way uh, I'm willing to do it freely. And I think that there's a lot of stigma around the word addiction, and you may have noticed that as the language over time from you know, the American Psychiatric Association goes from uh, substance use, substance abuser to substance use disorder. There's always a kind of a new, gentler way of saying these things. But I think that addiction is the quickest, fastest way that most people in the general public understand for what this is. And I think the general population are now ahead of academics in terms of reducing the stigma of addiction, knowing that it's not something that we need to punish people for, we need to help them to get out of, and whether it's a substance disorder or whether it's gambling or sex addiction or food, whatever it is, other behavioral disorders, revenge is part of that category. And I think when we call it that, then we're able to, we are now able to bring all of these resources to bear upon it. Well, you've convinced so us. I'm seeing, sure. I'm seeing movement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.